Hey skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. I'm Bob. Happy Friday. Yeah, welcome back to our Top 5 Friday Ski Industry News videos. Happy Friday. This week was just a, a blur, just a blip in our lives, huh? Yeah. It was this week? week? Yeah. This year? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, happy Friday. Also, happy uh, my birthday eve. Yeah, happy birthday eve. I don't know if that's a real thing, but... Well. I don't think you wish other people a happy <laughs> your own birthday eve, but whatever. Uh, I will be 36 years old when I wake up tomorrow morning. Yep, entering your old 30s. Yeah, as Bob pointed <laughs> out yesterday, I will officially be in my late 30s. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for pointing that one out, Bob. Well, next year I'll be in my upper 40s so really you'll be 40 i'll be 45 yeah that doesn't count you're you're in your mid 40s mid, yeah but close anyways um before we get into the news just one more reminder that we're in the entry period of the atomic sponsored ski happy program or ski happy contest program yep. <laughs> sure either one it's a program um we mentioned it yesterday in the bent 110 review you can't win a Bent 110, they're giving away a Bent 90. Um, to anyone that won in the vocal contest, I know you guys have been patiently awaiting your prizes. Um, we're still patiently awaiting those prizes from vocal. So as soon as we get them, we'll get them out the door. Uh, I appreciate your yep. patience. Uh, but yeah, you've got until Sunday this weekend to get some photos entered into the Atomic Ski Happy contest. And yeah, those Bent 90s are pretty sweet. I've been seeing them all over the Olympics. Yeah, Olympics, and we got to ski them this morning, and yeah. just a really fun ski. Yeah, I overshot that jump. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Good day so far. <laughs> um, and that kind of transitions us nicely into the Olympics. You know, we've been seeing a lot of bent 90s in the Olympics. And yep. our first topic of the week is uh, Olympic recap. It's been fun to watch. Yeah, it's been really fun to watch. Yep. Um, before we get into kind of our, our top five Fridays highlights, uh, what's your favorite part? Of doesn't the have, Olympics? Yeah, it doesn't have to be skiing related. Just curious. I love the short track speed skating. Yep. I think that's fun and fast and exciting. Yep. And, like that's what I think that's what I would like to do. Yep. If I was a that and curling, but I stayed up way too late the other night watching like two and a half hours of skeleton. I'm not into the sliding sport so much. I don't think there's much of like an entry point. But well, that's uh, that was fascinating to me. They were talking about it in the event, and they were saying that like most people don't get into it until their late teens. Right. Which is late to start an Olympic track. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Curling looks great. Short track. I mean, anyone's raced around a rink that's skated, you know? It's like you can understand what that's like. Yeah. Um, so I suppose you would be saying that you don't want to form a two-man bobsled team. No, nor dual, nor doubles luge. I saw that in that's, the relay yeah, last I feel like night. That, that's where I draw the line. <laughs> that's a pretty, pretty <laughs> weird event. <laughs> it is a weird event. <laughs> Um, so anyways, we do have some, uh, some top five Friday highlights from the Olympics. Um, unfortunately, kind of starting off with a, a bomber, um, two DNFs for Michaela. Yeah, I mean, that's, it just shows you the pressure gets to even the best athletes, you yeah. know, Simone in the summer and right. Michaela in the winter. I mean, it's just to operate at that high of a level for so long. Right. I mean, there's got to be a tipping point at some point, so... Yeah, and I suppose like in ski racing in general, like you don't finish every time. You're right. going to make mistakes. It's just a matter of time before you make mistakes in two consecutive races. Right. And it just looks, you know, it's kind of more glaring because they happened back to back, but yeah. things happen. Yeah, I think the magnification of 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 that is is hard for these top level athletes to totally deal with. Yeah, a bunch of us sitting at home on our couches just being like what the heck? What's the matter with you? you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Michaela bounced back with a ninth in Super G, and um, I thought the best part of that was she had a big smile across her face. Yep, I think that's time. important. Yeah, that's the most important part. Yep. So awesome to see, and she does have more events, so we'll be able to see more of Michaela skiing. Great. Uh, another kind of bummer was Nina O'Brien. Pretty was, bad. Yeah. Not a good, not a mm -hmm. good thing to look at. I'm like surprised that they showed so many of the pictures. It was her and the and the hockey player too that had pretty awful lower leg breaks that yeah were <laughs> graphically shown. Yeah, 
when I broke my femur, um, one of the few things that I remember is looking down and my boot was pointing in a different direction than yeah. I knew my hip socket was. And that was pretty unsettling. Yeah, that's where shock is a really helpful <laughs> yeah. bodily reaction. Yep. Um, so, yeah, Nina was going sixth into the second runs in Giant Slalom. Um, and, yeah, had an unfortunate bad crash. Yep. Bad, bad, bad leg injury. Um, so, yeah, we wish Nina a strong recovery, yep. speedy recovery, um, and, and hope you're staying positive, too. Those things can sometimes the mental side of it is just as hard as the physical side. Yeah, but as we've said before, even on this show, like these athletes bounce back really well. These ski racers yep. specifically seem to be able to get it back together, which is S impressive. Speaking of which, getting really good at these transitions, That's a good Bob's. segue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ryan Cochran Siegel. Yep. Picked up a silver medal in Super G, which to me was kind of capping off his recovery story. Yeah. I mean, I watched like a little video of him like learning how to like lift his arms again. Right. You know, go from that to, what was he, like four thousandths? Four hundredths. Four hundredths. Yeah. Off the, off the lead. Like that's pretty darn impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So way to go. Ryan Cochran Siegel, way to represent the Cochran ski community, yep. Cochran family. Um, and then Colby Stevenson picked up a second in Big Air. I made the cl claim way back that he was going to win slope style. So it came pretty close with that pick in Big Air and I'm doubling down on my claim. All right. He's your he's your slope style gold medalist. You were pretty close in the big air. Yeah, that we'll see. I, I think um, I think slope style is either on the 13th or 14th. So right around the corner, we'll find out if I'm yep. right or wrong. Um, on the Nordic side, Jesse Diggins picked up a third in the individual freestyle sprint. First time we've had a U.S. medalist in that event. Yeah. Really awesome. And we've talked about how much we enjoy watching the Nordic skiing too. I, that's one of those things that I want to see live. Yeah, it's really but cool. It's yeah. uh, it's they're just amazing athletes. Sprinting is especially fun to watch live because yeah. you can see more of it. Like any event where the where these people like collapse, like literally collapse at the finish line, that and the what was it the triathlon in the summer Olympics. Yep. You know that they're just they're done. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty funny because like I was a Nordic ski racer growing up. I was pretty serious about it. I cannot really relate to how fast they can ski. Yeah. But when they finish and they lay down in that finish area, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know that feeling. Uh, it's a weird feeling. It's like it feels good and bad at the same time. I've never pushed myself that hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, lots more Olympics to come, but it's been a great, great start to the game yep. so far. Um, second topic of the week, uh, we have a New York Times article that's kind of touching on the the topic that's really come into the forefront of the ski industry this season of – who gets to ski? Yeah, this is an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, so this is kind of surrounding the controversy, but really that's surrounding the Epic Pass. Yeah. You know, Vales dropped the price of the Epic Pass. They sold, what, 79% more. Um, that's resulted in some overcrowding of resorts or, or what people are complaining as overcrowding. Um, and there's this kind of like stark contrast between the the accessibility side of skiing and then the overcrowding like experience side, like where yeah. where is the happy medium? Um, and I don't know. We were trying to solve this problem before we started filming and Bob and I could not solve the problem. No, I guess my theory is that there's going to be a natural equilibrium at some point in the future that, you know, where we are on, on the scale now is tipping towards right. too many people. But, you know, then maybe that's going to, you know, inspire someone to make more ski areas. Like, right. you know, I don't know. I don't know. It seems yeah. like whenever that gets proposed, like something happens and it doesn't happen. You know, yeah. it's like there just aren't like ski areas popping up. But it does feel like a supply and demand thing. Right. You know, if, if there's drastic increased demand, let's get more supply. Right. And which, it's not like these people are going to turn down money. Right. You know, and you know, we were talking about it the other day here in the warehouse, and someone was like, well, let's just raise the prices. You know, like the stove pass used to be like $1,800 right. for stow only, which seemed astronomical. Right. But the lift tickets were cheaper. Yep. So if they go back to raising that price, then that lift ticket price is going to go down, whereas now that daily price is astronomical and right. prohibitive. Right. So, you know, it's just going to find a balance. 
Yeah, so really interesting article from New York Times. Bob and I certainly don't have the answer, but you're, if you're interested <laughs> in this kind of stuff, uh, definitely go check out that article. Um, and then we have a cool article from the Storm Skiing Journal on state-owned ski areas and the controversy that can occur there, uh, specifically surrounding gore in New York. Yeah, I was talking to my kids the other day, and they were asking me, like, where the most ski area, ski areas are. Or they were asking, like, if there was skiing in New York, I think was, yeah. was how it came up. Because they still view New York just as New A York city. city. Yeah. And I'm like, no, there's actually, like, almost 50 ski areas in New York. It has the most ski areas of any state in the country. Right. Um, so Gore is state-owned, and they're getting, like, $30 million for upgrades. Yep. It's all taxpayer-funded. Yep. So then these people with the private, you know, that own private resorts uh, are feeling left out because not only are their tax dollars going to fund Gore and other state-run resorts, but... Right, the you tax know, dollars from the skiers that ski their mountain are going to Gore right, also. Right, So everything's going to Gore. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, $30 million, a lot of money. You know, they're definitely, I think, looking for ways to spread that out more equally. You know, like a grant proposal yep. came up, like, let's pool it, let's split it up between these ski areas and kind of boost New York skiing in general right. as opposed to just, just focusing gore. on Gore. Yeah. So really interesting and very well-written article from yep. Storm Skiing. So definitely check that out if you're interested in that. Um, and then another cool article from the Washington Post, um, this one kind of highlighting four different resorts and how they're fighting climate change. Um, so one of them was Aspen's new energy source, uh, that like coal mine that was leaking methane gas that yep. they like converted into a power plant. We've talked about that before. Um, a solar array at Bluebird Backcountry, which I feel like it's easier to offset your uh, your energy consumption when you don't have lifts. Right. If you <laughs> like Bluebird, they don't have lifts or snowmaking. Like those seem to be pretty big energy sucks. Right. I mean, I, I laugh, but also right. like kudos to Bluebird Backcountry for right. being environmentally friendly. It's easy friendly. to be carbon neutral when you just have an open <laughs> field for skiing. Right. Um, Berkshire East was another one that they highlighted uh, as the only resort to generate 100% of their electricity on site. Uh, they do it through a wind turbine and a solar panel field. Yeah, and cool. I think that's cooler than like buying offsets. Totally, yeah, yeah. I agree. I like have a hard time with wrapping my mind around just like spending money right. as y that's your way to combat climate change is spending more money. Well, you gotta look at it as an investment in True. clean energy as opposed to just buying your way out of right putting a solar panel up yeah i guess no i think you're, you're right um we also got taos uh, and they kind of highlighted them as the only the only b corp ski area yeah which brings along a lot of responsibilities so really cool um if you're interested in that stuff check out that article from washington post as always all the links to all these articles um, are just in the description of this video so just right below. Click a little <laughs> arrow and drop down right there. Um, and then we have our edits of the week. Uh, first up, I don't think I had ever seen anything quite like this. Logan Pejota. Yep. Uh, skiing and sledding. And by sledding, we mean snowmobiling. The same lines. I think, like, analog sledding would have been cooler. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you get a Mad River rocket on or something like that. Right. I... I, I, I Made a note that it was snowmobiling because yep. the title of the video is sledding, and it, right. you know sledding is like the the cool term for snowmobiling. I don't think any backcountry snowmobilers say they're going snowmobiling or going sheening, <laughs> going sheening in the backcountry. They say they're going sledding, um, but really cool. It's like twelve minutes long. A lot of a lot of really cool terrain in there. Um, clearly, the guy knows how to ride a sheen. Yeah. Is that a term? Is that a I don't thing? know if you ride a sheen or you or just you sheen. Go, you just go sheening. I think riding a sheen is redundant. It, can sheen be a noun? It, it, I mean, I think you're using it as a verb. But can it be a noun? A sheen, I guess. A snow machine. Yeah, it's pretty shorthand, I would Any say. Any avid sledders out there, can you uh, verify or deny this for us? <laughs> um, can, you, can you go sheening? on your sheen. I will likely wake up at three o'clock in the morning tonight thinking, thinking about, about this conversation. Perfect. Then I have done my job. <laughs> um, next up, we have some highlights from the Backcountry Invitational, which was hosted by Tanner Hall. Uh, really, really cool. You know, they built a bunch of jumps on kind of a backcountry line. 
Um, I feel like a few years ago we had a lot more competitions like this, mm -hmm. so it's kind of cool to see another one. Yep. Um, and then we have a faction roots edit, point of view number five, threading the needle in the Dolomites. Do you watch this one, Bob? Yeah, sketchy. Yeah. I don't like that kind of stuff. I like big, yeah. wide, I feel like big wide open things. Yeah, there's a few really, really tight spots in there yeah. and some real near disasters. Yeah. I like being far from disasters. Sharp rocks, too. Those aren't like the friendly, smooth rocks that we have here in Vermont. No. They're very sharp and those are Those are young rocks. Yeah. We got old rocks got here old in Vermont. Rocks. Um, and then lastly, we have Candide, pretty tight. Uh, we mentioned this one last week, but Matt put it in the written top five this week, so I thought we'd mention it again. If you yep. didn't watch it last week, you should watch it this week. It's only a minute and 45 seconds out of your life and well worth it. Yep. Did you happen to see um, there was kind of an outtake video that Candy had posted as a story? I don't think so. Uh, when he backflipped into that kind of tight shoot, yep. um, they followed him with a drone, and there's an outtake video where he kicks the drone with his ski while he's backflipping, and then the drone bounces into one cliff wall and then bounces into the other cliff wall and then into the other cliff wall. All right. You got, yeah, you got check something that out. to do when yeah. I'm up at 3 in the morning. <laughs> thinking about sheen as a noun or a verb. Thinking about sheening and, uh, and drone operation. Yeah. Cool. Um, so that's it for Top 5 Fridays. Uh, once again, I'll be out there coaching tomorrow in a Green Mountain Academy jacket, so if you find yourself at Stowe, uh, Tap me on the shoulder and say hi. No one has done that yet, and I keep saying it. Maybe, maybe because it'll be your birthday, you'll get maybe I'll some get special some, treatment. Some birthday wishes. Yeah. People will say, I watched you on Top 5 Fridays. Happy birthday. <laughs> That'd be sweet. Yeah. I don't think that'll happen, but right. whatever. Um, so, yep, that's it. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. As a reminder, get some photos into the Atomic Ski Happy Contest. And, yeah, we'll be back next week with a couple more fun reviews. Um, and should should be back here on Friday with another Top 5 Fridays. Sweet. So we'll see you then. Have fun out there on the hill. Bye.